I am going to be making introductions of the organizers, the, all the partners that are contributing to this session, uh, because I wanted to start the program right away. I am, I will start with myself. Uh, my name is Marlene Ramirez. I am uh, the director for the regional office of Biodiversity International. Now, our next speaker is uh, Luis Gonzalo Moscoso Iguita from Forespa in, in Colombia, and he will talk to us about a natural approach to reforestation, gold mines, spoils, carbon credits, and rural development. Luis Gonzalo. Buenas tardes. Como inicio, quiero compartir la experiencia vivida durante mis últimos 20 años en proyectos de reforestación como empresa privada. Como ejemplo puntual, vamos a ilustrar con un proyecto de restauración de suelos degradados por minería de oro. Como, como ustedes conocen, estos proyectos de minería de oro es una de las formas más severas de degradación que existen. No es únicamente de restaurar y recuperar estos suelos, sino de involucrar a las comunidades presentes en ellas para un mejor futuro. Podrán notar también que es un desarrollo, una nueva desarrollo, desarrollo de la parte rural y un gran potencial económico y ecológico. Si detallamos lo que es un paisaje que deja la minería, vemos de verdad lo agreste y desolador y triste que queda. En Antioquia, departamento colombiano, cuya capital es Medellín, donde yo resido, tiene 45 mil hectáreas de suelos degradados. El la, diap la diapositiva que continúa es un proyecto en el cual tuve la oportunidad de trabajar durante 12 años, los últimos años, y podemos detallar las, las dos imágenes, inclusive las diferencias del paisaje. El paisaje inicial, cómo era de de cárcavas, compuestos de cárcavas, un paisaje compuesto de cárcavas, lleno de huecos, eh, con materia orgánica muy incipiente, en algunos casos sin presencia, y el paisaje después de los 12 años de edad. La comunidad, como decía anteriormente, es la base, es lo primordial en, en los proyectos. Aquí vemos una comunidad del proyecto Nechi, son la garantía del éxito de ellos, incluso gasto más tiempo en la parte social que en lo técnico. Ellos, y más aún en mi país, que existen tantos problemas de conflicto social. También no únicamente plantamos árboles, sino que involucramos como la seguridad, en la seguridad alimentaria producción agropecuaria, y hombres y mujeres, todo el núcleo familiar tiene que ver con la realización del proyecto. Hombres y mujeres y escogemos los líderes como capataces y supervisores del proyecto. Es tan así que el conocimiento es recíproco. De ellos vienen muchas enseñanzas, como es el caso de esta especie, el dicteris oleífera un árbol de madera muy fina, jerarca, pionero de la selva húmeda tropical, el cual cuando inicialmente germinábamos, no por ese fruto tan leñoso, el porcentaje de germinación era mínimo sus semillas. Pero los mismos campesinos nos contaron que ellos precisamente cazaban y hacían sus plataformas cerca a estos árboles de díter y soleífera porque allí venía la pava, el pauchí pauchí a anidar, arrumaba las semillas, las calentaban y ellas reventaban a los dos o tres días y daban origen 
a los arbolitos. Nosotros hicimos los semilleros de esa misma forma, con hojarasca y hoy tenemos eh, plántulas a los tres días con un porcentaje de germinación del 95%. hay un problema con el control, eh, anteriormente veíamos incluso que con proyectos, con prácticas sencillas se pueden hacer los proyectos de una forma muy práctica y cogemos todo lo que en la naturaleza a bien nos ofrece. Los germinadores Aquí tenemos, con estas prácticas sencillas y con los insumos de la región, producimos las plántulas con un sistema de calidad y gestión ambiental muy preciso, porque en el sustrato innovamos con hongos y bacterias. Ahí pueden ver los germinadores, eh, la producción vegetal, las ceras de crecimiento, cómo es la calidad. Cualquiera vería un paisaje de esto tan desolador, entrando ya a hablar el, la cuestión del estudio de caso, el ejemplo tangible en estos suelos degradados por minería, creeríamos que no se puede recuperar. Sin embargo, con, mire la, la calidad de sitio donde realmente son escombreras y residuos de cárcava, pero con un bulldozer liviano se empieza a hacer lo que es el paisajeado. Luego preparamos el sustrato o materia orgánica, utilizamos nuestro ingrediente principal en la fertilización, es orgánica, más del 80%. Utilizamos hongos y bacterias biológicos, utilizamos productos de aves de corral, porquerizas o bovinos, acondicionadores de suelo e hidroretenedores y además la base principal son lodos res lodos resultantes de las plantas tratamiento de aguas residuales, previo trabajo de compostaje, son preparados en su mayoría de veces en el mismo sitio donde vamos a hacer la reforestación. Como el trabajo difícil lo hace el, la, el establecimiento de la plantación, que es la restauración en estos suelos degradados, lo hacen mujeres cabeza de familia, un 85% por lo generalmente son viudas, que han estado, quedan sumidas en un abandono y una pobreza, y únicamente ellas establecen los árboles, hacen la siembra y ahí se ve la materia orgánica colocada en los surcos. Esto es la plantación con un mes de establecido, cinco meses de edad y siete meses. Miren la diferencia, lo que es la restauración del paisaje, el de la cuestión del desarrollo rural, la garantía de la parte del el rendimiento ecológico y económico y la misma atractivo de la biodiversidad. Aquí tenemos una fotografía, una imagen de un proyecto que tiene 10 años de edad. Si lo detallamos, notamos que hay muchas diferencias diamétricas en la plantación. Eso es realmente lo que queda para la continuidad de nuestros proyectos, porque nos faltan dentro de la ecuación varias variables por resolver, como es la descontaminación de los suelos, la selección de las semillas, los mismos sistemas de fertilización, en fin, muchas otras variables que tenemos que continuar. Eh, eh, incluso encontramos en el proyecto que se hallan ya árboles superiores, mejores que los otros promedios en general. Estos árboles son los que continúan para los proyectos futuros porque tienen otro potencial. Pero de este tema les hablará Ever Thomas en la conferencia que continúa, que es una herramienta en el manejo de, de las semillas para continuar unos proyectos que tengan mejor ganancia y mejores rendimientos. 
Como conclusión digo que no hemos ni inventado ni creado nada. Hemos observado con mucha atención y encontrado cosas que siempre han estado en la naturaleza, de la que hacen parte muy importante los nativos y pobladores de la región. Muchas gracias. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Gonzalo. Now I would like to invite Ever Thomas to talk to us from Biodiversity International to talk to us about the importance of genetic considerations in ecosystem restoration for enhancing resilience to climate change. Ever, I hope that works. Muchas gracias, Marleni. Um, sí, yo voy a hablar un poco más, el, el paso más allá. Ah, uh, sorry. Switch to English. Um, I'm, I'm going to, um, what, what Luis Gonzalo was introducing, I'm going to explain uh, a, a bit more in depth uh, the, what, what, what follows. No? The, because uh, his method it has proven to, to, to be working, but uh, there is need for some um, more science-based um, further development of the methods to make sure that it, it, it is resilient uh, in terms of climate change. So uh, in this talk, I want to draw the attention to the importance of genetic considerations in, in ecosystem uh, restoration for enhancing resilience against climate change. And although most of the, or many of the concepts I will discuss are more widely applicable, uh, my, my focus here will be uh, on tree-based restoration. So um, we all know by now that the scale of ongoing and planned restoration projects is really unprecedented. Uh, our G target 15 sets the bold goal to uh, restore 15% of all degraded land on Earth, which uh, more or less corresponds to 300 million hectares. There are several initiatives around the world that are working towards reaching this goal. Uh, one of the, the, the best known is the Bond Challenge, but tomorrow we will have the official launch of the 20 by 20 initiative, uh, which aims to restore 20 million hectares in Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, with this enormous scale uh, come huge ecological, uh, social and e economic opportunities, as Luis Gonzalo already introduced. So restoration has great potential to contribute to not only to biodiversity conservation, to combating desertification, climate change mitigation and adaptation, but it is also uh, has a lot of potential to boost uh, really the production of, of ecosystem services. And um, as introduced by Luis Gonzalo, has a lot of potential for income generation and rural development. However, uh, with the big scale of these planned projects come also uh, risks of failure. And failure can come in many forms. Uh, one of the probably most extreme forms is when uh, seedlings and saplings uh, sh die shortly after uh, planting. Another form which is um, less, less, less strong is when uh, plants do survive on site but show poor growth. Uh, in, the, in the photograph you see an example of an African tree species that was planted with its two individuals of the same species, so there is one individual in the red circle. Uh, both individuals were planted at the same time but from different seed sources, so it's clear that the one in the circle is, is not growing as well as the one in the back. Um, and not, it also happens that there is delayed mortality. So initially trees grow well, but then all of a sudden start dying. And this can be related to uh, extreme climate events. There is a, a famous example uh, of a, a plantation in Europe, in, in, in France. Uh, 30,000 hectares of a pine uh, tree were planted with uh, germplasm obtained from Spain. And after a cold winter, it was destroyed because it didn't have the, the necessary uh, uh, frost resistance. And a last example I want to give, uh, that is a, an, an example of failure, is when, you, when we sh see a drop in the quality and quantity of uh, seeds that are produced in, in planted forests. So in the photograph, you see uh, on, the, on the left, you see what fruit production looked like in a healthy stand, and on the right, you see what it look, looked like in a less healthy uh, planted forest. So how can we reduce risks and failures? It's of course important to apply good silvicultural practices, 
but we also need to uh, uh, give sufficient attention to the choice of, sp of the species we use, and this will of course take into account future uses of the forest, but also adaptability of the species to the site, uh, both under current and, and future climate conditions. Uh, and a third and equally important uh, factor are genetic principles in the selection of, of the planting material. So if we want the, the trees we plant today to become the healthy and resilient forests of tomorrow, we really need to give careful attention to the quality of the, of the planting material we use. And this means uh, taking into, in, into account uh, some basic genetic considerations. So just to frame it a bit, genetic diversity is, is the foundation for survival of trees on, on site. So for this, it is important to make sure that the origin of the seed we use is matched to the conditions of the, of the restoration site, so both under current and, and future. Uh, climate conditions. Uh, genetic diversity is also the foundation of, uh, for promoting good growth uh, on, on, on a site and to promote reproduction and resilience uh, o o across generations. So. Uh, and for this it, it is important to make sure that, that the seeds we use are genetically diverse enough uh, in order to avoid inbreeding, which can result in, 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 in a drop in, in seed quality and, and quantity. Uh, and also to make sure that there is sufficient genetic building blocks on, available on site to allow uh, evolution to, to select the best uh, individuals. So this all sounds nice and, and important, but how to apply it to the, to the field? Um, so at present we are, we are working on a project to restore tropical dry forest in Colombia, which we think could serve as a model. Uh, not only to uh, apply to, to tropical dry forests, but al also maybe other ecosystems and, and potentially other countries, uh, etc. So um, the, our objective here is to provide restoration practitioners with all the necessary information they need to carry out restoration uh, in any given site in, in Colombia in this case. Uh, and we want to uh, present the information through a map-based interactive tool. Um, so let's have a look, if this works. Okay, so the, the idea is to, um, to, to, to show a map on which uh, both relict forest areas are visible, so here in green, and uh, areas with potential for restoration of tropical dry forest uh, in, in red. And so the user can select uh, any, any site of his choice and will then be given uh, relevant information to guide restoration activities in each of those sites. Um, the one first piece of information uh, relates to the species selection. So what we want to do is we want to give, um, uh, provide for every specific site a list of the potential species one could use to carry out restoration. Um, this will be based on, on, on climate modeling under current and future uh, conditions. So, but in tropical dry forests, there are more than 900 different tree species, which already complicates um, the, the, the decision making. So our first filter is to work with only tree species that have already established uh, pro propagation protocols. And those in, in this case, we have found already 300 or so. So that, that is our first uh, filter. Um, next, we, well, and th this is also based on reality, at least in Colombia, that most, um, Restoration projects don't work with a very high number of species. They, they use five to 10, sometimes 20 different species, but that's it. So how to decide what combinations to use uh, um, on, on each site. So in the next step, we want to provide users with different options of, of, of species combinations um, that, 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 are, that are available. And uh, first and foremost, this, the decision of the, of the species combinations to use will be based on the future use, because the, the, the species one, one will use could be different depending on uh, if, the, if the objective is productive purpose, it has a productive purpose, or if, it's, if it is for biodiversity conservation, or it is, if it is for carbon sequestration, etc. So once the species choice has been made, we will then look for uh, combinations of of, um, of different, uh, sorry, once the, the future use of the, of the forest has been decided, we will then look for different species combinations that maximize the functional diversity. 
This means that we would look for uh, combinations of species that are complementary in the use of the limited uh, resources that are available on site, but at the same time also are complementary in the functions they, they, they um, contribute to the developing, developing ecosystem. An example is uh, combining a tree with a taproot that has uh, access to underground resources with a, another species that has superficial roots that then protects the, the soil against erosion, and yet another one that fixes nitrogen, and so, and so on. So then once uh, the, the species selection has been decided, we will then uh, give recommendations on, on potential seed sources. Uh, and so the decision making on, on, on the, the seed sources will be based on a number of information sources. We will use climate modeling, and combine it with uh, information uh, available on the distribution of genetic, genetic diversity in these species. But it will also include information on providers of, of, of seeds. Uh, in Colombia, we have the particular situation that this forest type, the remaining forest is all, almost all on private land. So we want to involve private landholders uh, in the provision of seeds for future restoration projects. And uh, this is a, a way to reward them for conserving forests uh, by selling seeds. And this, this is, can be significant because there are several species uh, who, uh, f for which one kilo of seed is more than, than one, um, um, the, 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 the amount of a wage of, of one mon month's labor. Um, this will also include um, best practices uh, on how to collect seeds because too f too still too often, uh, seeds are collected just from one tree, which uh, can have uh, complications for, for uh, the genetic uh, diversity. Uh, so we want, to, um, we want people to collect at least 30 trees per, per population. And then the last piece of information uh, we want to give uh, potential restoration practitioners uh, relates to propagation protocols, how to propagate uh, different species and how uh, to plant them in the field. So I want to end with a number of concluding remarks. First of all, I want to draw the attention to the fact that IG target 15 is not only quantitative, it's not only about restoring 300 million hectares, it's also qualitative. It also, um, it, it, it also matters what species are used and what, what the seed sources are. And fortunately, this was uh, recognized recently during the, the 12th COP of, of uh, CBD in Korea, uh, where, which invites uh, stakeholders to give due attention to both native species and genetic diversity in restoration activities. Um, for this, there is a need for political commitment. We need to create uh, demand for good quality seeds of native trees, and this could, for example, be done through uh, appropriate regulatory frameworks or, or resource allocations. Um, we also need to make sure that decision-making by restoration practitioners, and most, is most definitely we will have a growth in, in, in different actors uh, working on, on restoration. So we need to make sure that those actors have um, uh, access to, to knowledge-based uh, guidelines and, and protocols, uh, and, and they need to be available in, in tools that are useful for them. And we need to uh, apply adaptive management. We need to learn more from mistakes, from previous mistakes and failures, and we need to continuously integrate a new knowledge, because this is really an, an, an emerging field. And last slide, um, we need to take a landscape approach when we develop individual restoration projects. We need to try to uh, interconnect different projects uh, among each other, but also with, with the remaining vegetation to promote uh, gene flow and species migration. Another field of, uh, of, of work is um, that, that we need to uh, invest more in evaluating the effectiveness of different restoration methods that have been developed around the world uh, to establish viable ecosystems and, 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 and that are able to restore genetic diversity. So we need to start measuring adequate indicators and put in place uh, appropriate monitoring protocols. And last but not least, I think there is great potential uh, to combine uh, restoration um, with, with conservation. There is a lot of potential to plant endangered species in restoration plots and experiment with assisted migration. Um, and this is my, my last slide and I want to thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Ever. We have collected a few questions, and uh, while I organize some of them, I'm going to start with uh, a few that have to do with uh, livelihoods. Uh, there were two questions for uh, Luis Gonzalo, and uh, uh, one of them says, uh, if, uh, if agriculture is possible in the restored areas, that's one. Uh, considering the possible heavy metal contamination. And the other one is what do people do after they have been uh, employed in the restoration efforts? So those two are sort of related, if you can answer them. Sí, qué bien las dos preguntas porque me ha quedado la sensación porque se me han movido las imágenes. La primera es porque siempre en estos sitios que se hace restauración hay suelos que no han sido tocados con minería. Entonces, se pueden aprovechar haciendo la parte de la agricultura. La otra pregunta que se refería era... ¿Qué hacen las personas que están directamente en el proyecto? Todo lo que son las labores culturales que conciernen al mismo, se capacitan y se sensibilizan. Por esa razón decíamos que se gasta más tiempo en lo social, enseñándole lo que es el cambio cultural de la minería a la restauración, a la conservación. Y hay algo que se me ha pasado porque se me movió la imagen, es decirle lo que en esas dos diapositivas, que ese proyecto que apenas lleva 12 años, nos ha aparecido un jaguar, otros mamíferos, avifauna, entomofauna. Es el primer proyecto en América Latina, en Sudamérica, registrado para bonos de carbono, y en el mundo que genera bonos de carbono único, porque es de minería, porque es de restauración, porque involucra personas que están en un conflicto social y porque se están dando otras iniciativas de desarrollo rural. Genera ciento, son 1.292 hectáreas y genera en bonos de carbono 150 mil dólares no más, sin contar los ecobeneficios, como es la madera, porque el proyecto es comercial, no es un gasto, es una inversión, es una inversión que se retorna en los turnos de reforestación, porque hay especies que se pueden aprovechar en el año cuarto, como el croma piramidali y la guado angustifolia. Entonces, un proyecto integral de mejora del paisaje, de desarrollo rural, de biodiversidad y un proyecto económico. Thanks, uh, Luis Gonzalo. We will have another uh, segment of uh, questions and I will reserve some of the, the questions for that. But I have another one for Evert and if you can respond to that one in one minute, it would be great. It's uh, just a point of clarification. If the, your, the tool that you're developing is limited to the dry forest in, in Colombia or is it also applicable to other forest ecosystems and other countries in the region? Uh, well, the idea, as I, as I said in, in the beginning of, of the speech, the idea is that we, we, we see it as a model. So we hope that it will be applicable to other ecosystems, uh, to other countries. I mean, eventually it could, it could be developed into a world map of, of restoration, but this is obviously very optimistic. Thank you very much. Now we have a, a, the, a second block of uh, presentations uh, around uh, agriculture in the Andes. And uh, the first speaker is uh, um, Alejandro Argumedo from Andenes, and he will talk about the potato park landscape uh, the Potato Park landscape-based adaptation model and the Sip Potato Park repatriation. And Dave Ellis will also follow him on the same, it's the same title. Gracias, uh, Marlene. 
Ah, buenas tardes con todos. Mi nombre es Alejandro Argumedo y lo que voy a hacer es que, mientras yo hablo, voy a pasar una um, fot video fotografía um, que contexto en inglés. Um, primeramente, quiero um, agradecer a CAFS y especialmente a Sonia Bermulen, porque nos ha permitido traer a nuestros compañeros del Parque de la Papa y otros compañeros de varios lugares. El contexto de esta presentación es el cambio climático y la agricultura, uh, sus impactos en la seguridad y soberanía alimentaria, y cómo en la región del Cusco, uh, de donde venimos, eh, estamos tratando de responder a este, a este gran desafío. Um, sabemos de que el, el, el cambio climático, um, o lo que, lo que decimos cambio climático, uh, que dentro de, del, del contexto andino lo vemos como una desestabilización que está causando um, una reacción eh, de molestia de la Pachamama, de la Madre Tierra. Uh, eh, perdón, um, tiene eh, pues, eh, eh, uh, una historia bastante, uh, bastante grande o bastante uh, antigua. Tenemos... Uh, 8000 años de agricultura, um, una sociedad que se ha desarrollado dentro del marco del, eh, del niño. Entonces, eh, pues, eh, nuestros pueblos um, han, uh, han evolucionado dentro de un laboratorio vivo, tanto de, de diferentes cambios que han tenido como de respuesta de adaptación que continuamente se vienen gestando. Y, y esto en estos momentos eh, se ha vuelto um, bastante eh, agudo. Um, está la, los diferentes impactos que se ven, tienen una, um, están creando cambios en la manera como el conocimiento tradicional es tratado, pero obviamente también en la supervivencia de, de, eh, en, de la población um, y... Eh, en el contexto de la um, seguridad alimentaria. Um, las, uh, los problemas de eh, baja productividad uh, son mayores, el incremento de eh, enfermedades, de plagas, um, eh, es mayor. Um, y eh, pues eh, para responder a esto, en, en el año 2000, um, seis comunidades del distrito de Pisac se unen para de una manera conjunta responder a diferentes tipos de desafíos que se venían presentando uh, y con una respuesta uh, integral. Um, los, eh, muchos de, 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 de los uh, indicadores que hablamos aquí han, uh, se vienen uh, um, eh, experimentando en el, en el Parque de la Papa, um, particularmente el movimiento de cultivos a zonas más altas a causa de enfermedades y el, el calentamiento del suelo, uh, la ocurrencia de eventos extremos uh, es cada vez más, uh, más frecuente y um, uh, sobre todo el, la, el, el, este, el impacto que había tenido en la, la diversidad uh, de cultivos. De los años 1970 um, para arriba se perdieron un buen número de, de, de papas nativas y esto um, tuvo um, eh, efectos en, la, uh, en, la, en los conocimientos tradicionales, en, eh, en la manera como um, se respondían um, a partir de um, eh, el, los... El, eh, indicadores biológicos o indicadores culturales para seguir manteniendo uh, productividad. Um, el Parque de la Papa misma es eh, eh, esta asociación um, eh, desarrolla um, eh, un, una, una propuesta o ha desarrollado una propuesta de manejo integrado de paisajes cuyos objetivos buscan en primer lugar Obviamente, la, la mejorar la producción agrícola para eh, responder a la inseguridad alimentaria, um, tener eh, eh, una, 
un, un modelo de conservación que combine conocimiento tradicional con um, eh, conciencia, um, utilizar esa diversidad para mejorar la, la economía local y crear una institucionalidad que pueda servir para coordinar actividades y planificar respuestas. Y dentro de todo este contexto, pues, uh, utilizar la cultura como un elemento unificador y tener también um, eh, eh, propuestas que puedan um, articular la conservación de bienes y servicios eco eco ecosistémicos al, um, al manejo del paisaje agrícola. Um, los, las prácticas que, que se realizan, um, las prácticas económicas siguen, um, uh, eh, siguen eh, eh, teniendo eh, un un marco de economía ecológica y economía um, más de, de, de tipo de mercado de, de monetaria y, y todo esto ha dado la posibilidad para que eh, tanto um, el, el, este, eh, estas, estas prácticas y las, y las prácticas económicas tradicionales como las posibilidades de, de articularlas a um, um, a los mercados uh, uh, regionales, pues uh, dieron la oportunidad para que se pueda generar uh, esta propuesta. En, um, en, en uh, el 2004 uh, tuvimos la oportunidad de, eh, eh, a través de, de um, una relación inicial que habíamos tenido con el Centro Internacional de la Papa, de Um, trabajar juntos para uh, eh, crear un marco de colaboración a partir de un acuerdo de repatriación por el cual el Centro Internacional de la Papa um, eh, restauraba la diversidad uh, genética que se había perdido en el parque, eh, eh, de, trayendo o, o llevando uh, de vuelta, de regreso, las papas que se habían perdido dentro de, dentro de la región y particularmente en la zona del Parco de la Papa. Um, esta, este proceso de repatriación um, ha tenido pues, eh, un impacto que eh, en, en este momento, um, eh, contabilizándolo o haciendo un, una, una, un análisis de cual, qué tipo de beneficios eh, se han generado, um, eh, nos, da, nos da como resultado um, cómo uh, esta colaboración uh, entre científicos, uh, entre autoridades uh, en, del, uh, del gobierno regional, uh, ONGs y, la, um, y, el, este, y el, el Centro Internacional ha producido um, uh, beneficios concretos. En primer lugar, la repatación de 410 variedades eh, incrementó la diversidad de una manera um, um, bastante amplia. Con eh, el regreso de las papas, eh, regresó mucho las prácticas culturales como el, el santuruma. Mis compañeros pueden eh, eh, contarles un poquito más de esto, por el cual se amarra la, el espíritu de la papa para que ésta siga manteniendo su... Um, a productividad. Se han creado um, proyectos de agroecoturismo, uh, proyectos uh, de producción de champús, eh, jabones, chocolates, eh, todo de papa y eh, esto ha generado ingresos económicos adicionales a las comunidades. Um, por supuesto, eh, todo, esto, todo este proceso uh, ha servido para a tener la oportunidad de, de, de que eh, la, los miembros de las comunidades se capaciten uh, tanto eh, en la adquisición de, de nuevas uh, uh, técnicas de producción de estos productos, pero también en capitalizar um, uh, sus comunidades. Eh, existe una red de, de, de bancos de semillas, de, um, de invernaderos, um, de eh, um, un restaurante dedicado a la papa nativa 
y una infraestructura que eh, es eh, propiedad de todas las comunidades. En, en, uh, en conclusión, ¿no? el, el, el tipo de, de relación que se puede tener eh, entre los científicos y las comunidades um, cuando esto, los objetivos van más allá de, de una in investigación, un marco de investigación eh, eh, reducido y ven beneficios más amplios, pues eh, pueden producir eh, impactos o efectos que eh, tienen eh, una, un, una, una, este, un beneficio directo con el desarrollo sustentable de las comunidades la, su creación de capacidades y el mantenimiento de sus derechos. Uh, en, el, en el caso del Parque de la Papa, se usa una marca colectiva que eh, no solamente promueve el, los productos de, del parque, pero también es un, un modelo de, 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 de protección de, tanto del, de, de ese nombre de identidad como... Uh, eh, facilita pues eh, la cohesión entre las diferentes comunidades. Creo que en, eh, es el, el este, el, eh, eh, más allá de esto, claro, los, eh, eh, la articulación que tiene eh, al, a procesos eh, tanto nacionales como internacionales eh, a, es eh, bastante claro. Eh, podemos decir que las, um, los, este, los, uh, las metas de Aichi uh, pueden, ser, eh, <coughs> pueden ser respondidas a través de este tipo de proyectos. Igualmente, mucho de lo, de, del protocolo o mucho de los um, uh, um, articulados del protocolo de Nagoya um, <coughs> pueden estar contenidos y dentro de los, um, del, del marco de las NAMAS y, y otros, otras políticas de adaptación nacional, creo que eh, eh, este tipo de, de acuerdos pueden ser muy relevantes. Muchas gracias. Es esta, ¿sí? Hi, now I'd like to invite Dave Ellis from the International Potato Center. Thank you, and thank you, Alejandro, and thank you, my brothers and sisters from the Potato Park. Could you please stand up? <laughs> Muchas gracias. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit today. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, follow up on uh, Alejandro's talk. And talk a little bit about the diversity of the potatoes that we, uh, we have. ¿Quieres enseñarle a todo? and talk about the science, a little bit of the science behind what we're doing with Parque de la Papa. Buenas tardes o buenas noches con todos ustedes. Um, a nombre de todos mis co colegas del Parque de la Papa, quiero hacer llegarle uh, a usted mi agradecimiento y un saludo um, de hermandad a todos. Genaya, huay que pana y cuna, no canches y manachtinchos, no caña o pacta, agradecido con su huay canches que hay centro internacional manta cachan. Paikunaya, ya panchispa, mi junanchista, jawarispa, caipe, kay suma, mujukunata, wakay chasanku. Entonces, mai pachachos, no kay kupas, kay mujukunata, riki, wakay chamshay, kuchaka, teximuyon tempe, kay pachamama, piñakui, 
Mana nishuta y arcaimanta, apachuana en Spagia, que hay una salva a Sunches, no canchista. Y um, como uh, se ha explicado antes y como nuestro colega del Centro Internacional de la Papa está diciendo, um, y nosotros del parque estamos muy agradecidos tanto con el Centro Internacional de la Papa como con otras instituciones que están involucradas en el mantenimiento de esta diversidad de Papa, que frente a, lo que, a, a, esta, a este calentamiento que, que global que vemos, um, eh, pues son la mejor, eh, um, el mejor seguro de vida que podemos tener en el mundo. Huele para ahí con a asuampas no canches ya pan te hace muy ope te ha cuna ya que es o más asca te acampe mujucunata mana papayatacho o acá hay chananches que ya que cuy con a jamo a chananches que hay cunata que hay un saya chinanches pach entonces mana cha futuro man jamo juaguanches con a pas y arcaimanto guanyunanta monasun mancho pero que ya que cuy con a tas saya chinanches ya pan asca te acampe mujucunata Wakai chaspanches, chaywan sostenta kusun chiarca y kuna hamo hamos kanta. Gracias wakai kapana y kuna. Quiero terminar diciendo de que la conservación de la papa nativa no debe ser solamente una responsabilidad de de instituciones que nos acompañan acá, sino de todos, particularmente los agricultores como nosotros que debemos de nuevamente apreciar la diversidad, solamente con la diversidad es que vamos a poder responder y asegurar que nuestros niños puedan tener alimentación en el futuro. Muchas gracias. Ok, thank you very much. What, um... Thank you very much. What, uh, following up on what Alejandro mentioned, he mentioned an agreement that we have with uh, Parque de la Papa, and really it's a partnership. And it's a three-way partnership between Andes, Parque de la Papa, and SIP, at least the way we see it. And it has many components. Started to highlight the use and understanding of native diversity, and what I, and that's become very much an information chain, uh, exchange. And what I'd like to talk about briefly today is just expand a little bit about what Alejandro said about uh, the repatriation. Parque de la Papa, he talked about climate change. Let me give you a little bit of data on how fast this climate change has happened in Parque de la Papa, unprecedented that I know of in the scientific literature. 1982, 3,800 meters is the uh, lowest point that, uh, or it's the highest point that, I'm sorry, the lowest point that uh, potatoes were grown in the park. By 2007, it was, what's that, 1,950 1, meters. Last year, the lowest point we grew potatoes in the park was about 4,020 meters. If you look at that, that's a 200 meter change in 30 years. This 200 meter change in this 30 year period happened because uh, of warming environment lower down where you could no longer cultivate potatoes and I'll show you um, data on that a little further on. But more importantly, we can grow potatoes lower down. It's just that they're so heavily diseased and in, uh, insect infected that it's not worth getting a um, cultivation on. Um, the SIP gene bank, we heard earlier about an Exito gene bank, holds 15,000 accessions, uh, collections of uh, cultivated material, mostly potato and sweet potato. What we'll talk about today is this potato collection. Our goal is to conserve diversity, but it's not to conserve it in a museum, it's to conserve it for use. And what I want as a gene bank manager is I want my great-great-great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren to be able to have the same genetic diversity and opportunities to help uh, use that diversity in plant improvement to secure food, to uh, in, ensure food security, as my father did. And so we want to preserve this material for a minimum of 100 years and beyond. 
When I talk about repatriation, what we're doing is taking the varieties that grew in and around these communities and they're no longer growing and giving them back to them. A real easy example to understand is this uh, community in Ayacucho that we repatriated material due to terrorism. Shining Path moved in, they moved out, dropped everything because they were feared for their lives. Cows, chickens, pigs, and potatoes were left in the field. Many years later, when they returned, they had nothing. Fortunately, we had preserved that material at SIP, and so we returned it to them. But what I want to talk about is the six communities in Parque de la Papa and the partnership that we've had using this same kind of theme as repatriation. With global climate change, we know we, we've got a large challenge with drought, frost, and disease resistance. We do continual research looking at this. Here was an artificial uh, drought study that we did where we just at flowering covered everything so they got no natural water and looked at what survived. What was interesting and what was rewarding is that those that we found that were resistant to drought and resistant to frost were the same things the farmers selected in other sites. So we've got good correlation on what we're doing and the knowledge that the farmers have. Taking this into Parque de la Papa, we took these varieties into Parque de la Papa and we set up an elevational gradient where we have plots going every hundred meters on up the uh, mountain up to 4,450 meters. This is the third year that we've done this. We're going to plant this plot, these plots again next, uh, next week. And here is, for those of you that know the Parque de la Papa, here is Paru Paru, the weather station that we have in Paru Paru. It's a collaborative effort where we plan uh, these plots together. We talk about what our goals are. We talk about what we want to accomplish. We then have joint planting. Um, there it's growing here. This is uh, the 4,250 4, meter plot. You can see some of the varieties have been affected by frost. Some are still doing very well. And then we harvest together. After the harvest, we then come back, look at what we have, and as a group, analyze the results. This is what happens below 4,000 meters today. This is the type of potatoes that you see. They're all eaten by bugs. They're, the harvest is none. But what we do at the end of the day, after we've done all the harvesting, after we've analyzed everything, weighed everything, looked at disease and, um, disease and insect pressure, we then sit down and we talk about the results. What did each one of us individually from SIP and what did each one of us individually from Parque de la Papa see? And how do we interpret the results that we have? And how can we use these results for next year to build the database and to start to uh, help look at how we're going to uh, combat together this phenomenon of uh, a warming climate? I want to just close with the uh, uh, concept of Aini. Very, very strong. Alejandro mentioned it as well. In Spanish, it's yo te doy, tu me das. I give to you, you give back. And that's very much what the Parque de la Papa does every time we go up and every time we get together. In the context of repatriation, we've gotten over 250 varieties back from Parque de la Papa that we did not have in our gene bank. These are now varieties that will con be conserved, but more importantly, these are varieties that can then be distributed or made available to help uh, move our um, issues uh, with climate change forward. And I'd just like to reinforce that we're working with identification of frost and drought resistant varieties for Parque de la Papa, in Parque de la Papa, for the other communities in the Andes, and that there's no question in our mind that collaboratively this is a living laboratory that we're able to do these experiments in and without the association with Parque de la Papa, without all our brothers and sisters, we wouldn't be able to do this. So thank you. Hello. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dave. I, we have a, a couple of questions for this uh, very uh, 
brief uh, session of questions before the last uh, presentation. And uh, uh, I think there, there's one that uh, is, uh, what were the original reasons or drivers to shift from uh, non-native potato varieties in the first place? And who drove them? I, and uh, are there any crop wild relatives within the potato park? And what is their, uh, their efforts for conservation in, in situ or ex situ? And uh, yes, would you like okay. to take some? Yeah. My apologies if I misled you. Yeah. We are not working with any improved varieties in the park. We may do a uh, particip participatory selection, but right now everything is land race material. It's material that has been collected over the last 30 and 40 years, and it's uh, conserved at SIP. And it, what these 400 varieties that were repatriated to the park were varieties that had been collected 30, 40 years ago in the Sacred Valley, and for the most part were no longer being grown in Parque de la Papa. And what we wanted to do was bring those varieties back and see whether they might be able to be used. Um, the other question. Uh, yes, um, that was about the, other the crop world relatives. Crop world relatives, lots of crop world relatives of potatoes in the park. And we do document, there has been studies done. There's no active effort right now with them. None of them are endangered, but uh, there are lots of, uh, I can probably name five species right now that, of uh, native potato that we see in the park. And a related quick question is, uh, how is that the state in, in Peru can uh, access the information about the bank, the germplasm? It's all publicly available. Right now, the best source actually is an international website because we're redoing our website called Genesis, G-E-N-E-S-Y-S. -E -E you can just go online, Google it, find it. You can enter in Peru. And everything, the entire p potato collection that we have at SIP is now online at Genesis, publicly available. For Alejandro, uh, a question about if you can name one, a, or the, the success factor for the potato park. Creo que el, el factor de, de suceso, de, de éxito acá, ha sido de que em, contra la corriente, eh, seis comunidades se unen y crean una institucionalidad común para manejar eh, territorios que de otra manera estarían en, compitiendo. Entonces, eh, creo que el, eh, para cualquier tipo de, de suceso se necesita de que haya una institucionalidad fuerte y esta institucionalidad en este caso Uh, ha mantenido uh, normatividad, reglas consuetudinarias, por el cual eh, se ha podido, por ejemplo, crear un acuerdo entre las comunidades para la repartición equitativa de beneficios, uh -huh. uh, siguiendo tanto esta normatividad consuetudinaria como el marco internacional uh, de acceso y repartición equitativa de beneficios. Right, and a related uh, question is, uh, how could, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, how can we, uh, I guess, uh, take up or utilize uh, tools as the commu uh, biocultural community protocols to uh, protect and uh, value the traditional knowledge? I guess that you mentioned some of that from the both from the within the communities and from the from the state. This is related to obviously traditional knowledge for the development of adaptation and mitigation strategies. I guess. Sí, creo que um, este es este es un tema bastante um, importante porque la experiencia con recursos genéticos es una en donde la biopiratería ha sido una constante y una apropiación tanto de recursos um, eh, genéticos y eh, conocimiento tradicional. En el caso del Perú, pues podemos mantener la maca, la quinoa, um, el, el, la ñuña y muchos otros cultivos y los conocimientos asociados que han sido, um, eh, que son, este, han sido fuente de patentes fuera. Y también uh, el, el, este, la, el, el um, una, um, 
una política nacional que todavía no es muy fuerte, pienso, en la protección de estos conocimientos y los recursos, uh, sus recursos asociados. Uh, si es que no se consideran estos casos, pienso de que la, uh, los uh, procesos de, a, asociados a adaptación, en donde se va a usar tecnología uh, um, tra, de, derivada del conocimiento tradicional, donde se van a abusar eh, eh, las prácticas, eh, creo que necesitan pues, ser considerados para que haya una protección y un marco adecuado que eh, no, no um, eh, viole las, um, los derechos de las comunidades. Thanks very much. We have a, a number of questions, but we will leave them for after the last presentation. I'd like to invite our last uh, presenter, uh, Cristina. Swiderska from C4 with S and IIED to talk to us about the role of traditional crops, knowledge and innovation in adaptation. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm from IIED, but um, the project I'm going to talk about, if we can get the slides up. Hello? Eh, la presentación, por favor. Okay, is, is called C4 with an S. I apologize to everybody from C4 with a C, but this was the best acronym we could come up with. Um, this project is a, a partnership uh, with Andes and the Potato Park and also other partners in China, Kenya and India. Um, we, it, the title is Smallholder Innovation for Resilience. It's a five-year project. It aims to strengthen traditional knowledge-based innovation systems uh, for food security in the face of climate change. And I want to um, highlight some of the findings from a baseline study we've done uh, on um, innovation that's going on in traditional farming communities in risk-prone environments which have been quite affected by climate change already, like the Potato Park, it's one of them, um, but also uh, some uh, coastal Kenya, dry land and semi-arid areas there, and also two other mountain cases, the Indian Himalayas and southwest China. So the baseline study looked at trends in livelihoods, crop diversity, climatic changes in the last 30 years, and then looked at the innovation responses that the communities have developed based on their traditional knowledge and traditional crops. We've also done a quite a big quantitative survey to complement that, but uh, the findings haven't been analysed yet, so I'm just going to talk about the qualitative one. So the impacts, just to summarise, um, all of the villages have had significant um, challenges for production, particularly in the last 10 years, and key challenges are reduced and more erratic rainfall, uh, more extreme events and in an increase in pests and diseases. So in Yunnan, southwest China, they've had a severe drought for the past four years, which is unprecedented in their memory. Um, in central Himalayas, there's been a sharp decline in crop productivity in the last five to seven years, partly due to rainfall decline um, and uh, partly due to um, forest degradation um, and crop increased crop raiding by wild boars. Eastern Himalayas, they've, they've found that they now have about 50% less water available for, ir for irrigation and for drinking. The water sources are, are drying up. Coastal Kenya, they've had frequent incidences of drought and hunger and high levels of pests and diseases. And the potato park you've heard about quite a lot, so I'll skip that one. Um, so what responses? Um, how are they coping? Well, a, a big... Uh, finding is that, um, that tr traditional crop varieties have been absolutely essential in every case in all of those 64 villages that we looked at for reducing risk because even though they might be less high yielding than modern varieties they very often have higher resilience to these climatic changes and so they're really critical for food security. Uh, for example in, in the central Himalayas they've switched to um, traditional finger millet that uh, needs less water, it's very nutritious. Eastern Himalayas, they switched to traditional mustard, 
Uh, it's more resistant to soil pests, to dew damage. South of China, they've switched to drought-tolerant maize, wheat, and rice land races. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a, another slide with some evidence of the comparison between the maize land races and... and um, here we go. So there was a big drought in the spring of 2010 in southwest China. And if you look at this picture here, these are all the land races. You can see some green there. They all survived. And here is where the hybrid maize was planted. And there's nothing that survived there. Um, we also, going back to this point, uh, our partners did some DNA analysis of 191 maize land races and compared them with um, varieties held in gene banks for the last 20 to 30 years and found that there are much higher genetic diversity in the land races and also more traits that uh, look, um, provide drought resistance. Uh, in Kenya, they also switched to pest and drought tolerant maize and cassava and planting them alongside fast maturing varieties so that you know, it, it reduces risk of crop loss if they, if they just plant fast maturing varieties which are less resilient then they could lose everything. Um, also another important strategy um, to reduce risk is uh, going back to traditional farming practices because they're more biodiverse. Mixed cropping for example is now intensively practiced in the eastern Himalayas intercropping has been revived in southwest China, uh, also to improve soil fertility. And, you know, in, in some of these cases, they still plant some modern varieties, but there has definitely been a revival of a, a much stronger dependence on traditional crops in the last 10 years or so. Uh, the other point I want to highlight um, of, from our findings is that farmers are actively breeding new varieties uh, based on their traditional methods, their traditional knowledge, uh, completely on their own, without any scientific help. Um, here are some examples. In the central Himalayas, um, a farmer bred an improved radish variety, crossing a hybrid with a traditional variety, doing lots of experiments over six years. Um, and it's been a very successful, it's in great demand. Um, Eastern Himalayas, a new cultivar of black bean rice with higher yield was developed a new pest-resistant cardamom variety. In the potato park, I'd like to refer to the gradual selection of native cultivars um, resistant to pest, disease, frost. In Kenya, they've um, had some success with uh, breeding livestock based on crossing indigenous and hybrid varieties. And the result has been uh, livestock which is both more productive and more drought tolerant. And then... Um, Traditional knowledge has also you know, been used in, in other ways to improve adaptation and, and resilience. Um, one of the things in, in Kenya, they've domesticated quite a number of uh, food and medicinal plants and trees because there are forest communities and that's been really important to confront um, problems with reduced productivity and also provided new market opportunities. Uh, for example, planting fruit trees has helped with that. Um, Traditional knowledge in all of the cases has been used to develop effective biological pesticides um, which have really helped them cope with this increased pests that they're facing. In Kenya, they've used some traditional treatments which have been effective in treating livestock. Uh, they've developed also in a number of places new composting techniques for improving soil fertility and moisture. Oh, I can't seem to... Oh, there we go. Oh, here's the radish breeder. Oh, sorry. There we go, there's the enormous radish. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to point now to an example, which I was, um, as I was listening to the experience of SIP and the potato park, I found there were many similarities with, with an experience of participatory plant breeding in southwest China, which is linking traditional knowledge and science in a mutually supportive, collaborative way. Um, this program started in 2010, and it's had some really impressive results. It's, it's bred eight new varieties of maize um, with about 15 to 30% higher yields 
and higher drought and pest resistance. It's conserved 200 resilient land races and improved 30 farmer preferred maize land races. So the farmers' um, land races are better adapted to the local conditions but less yield, high yielding. So this improvement has improved, strengthened their yielding. Um, and it's increased incomes by 30%, and that is compared to villages growing hybrid maize. Because, not just because of the PPB um, gr leading to greater productivity, but also activities related to it, which are strengthening market linkages, and also benefit sharing agreements between plant breeders and local communities involved in the PPB. And this PPB program has also revitalized traditional farming practices because traditional knowledge has been recognized and used uh, for participatory plant breeding. Um, it's been um, much easier for um, farmers to recognize and value and, and start um, revitalizing their traditional farming practices. Um, for example, the duck and rice integrated pest management, um, which means that they don't have to use so many pesticides, and so then it has mitigation benefits as well. Um, and I think what's um, important to highlight that participatory plant breeding is very much about joint decision making at every stage of the process. So scientists and farmers decide on the goals together, and at every stage they decide. Uh, on the design of, of the process, and they do the analysis together. Um, and that's very, very empowering for farmers, and it strengthens local knowledge and innovation systems, and thereby strengthens the resilience of farmers. Because with climate change, you know, the most certain thing is that uh, the weather is more variable and more unpredictable. So local capacity to innovate is really crucial for resilience. And then, just to, as, as Dave um, also highlighted before, um, similarly, in this case, plant breeders also benefit because they have access to a wider genetic resource base for plant breeding. Uh, so there's the pictures of PPB in China and some ducks. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So this slide is really, because I haven't got time to tell you all the results of the baseline study, but um, it's just to give a summary of uh, the different innovations that were identified, technological innovations, market innovations, institutional and policy innovations. And um, the sort of key ones to highlight, as I've said, there's been a lot of domestication in the Kenya place, uh, case using forest resources and livestock breeding. Um, a cultural village they've established in one of the traditional Kaya forests, both to increase income from tourism, but also um, as a way to strengthen cultural values and plant land races and exchange them with other villages. Um, to highlight within the Peru section, these are the technological innovations. There's been a really strong uh, level of market innovations and institutional policy innovations as well. And the other ones, it's a lot of technological innovations, but less of these two. And I think that probably reflects a very, um, the, the very strong collaborative relationship they have with the NGO Andes. Um, and you know, all these are, are very much joint innovations that they've had um, support through co-research with the NGO Andes. Um, in India, they've, had, they've developed a huge number of innovations to change their cropping practices. And crop raiding has been really serious for these communities. And they've had to shift all their fields to come right next to their houses to stop this you know, damage to their crops. And so they've really had to change their cropping systems. Um, and um, they've set up a group... Um, vegetable uh, collection for transporting to market because they're very remote and they don't produce, the smallholder farmers don't produce enough, so that's a, a market innovation. And crop protection committees to um, monitor crop raiding by wild boars. And um, 
this labour sharing is a tr traditional institution which is very important for um, revitalising traditional knowledge. Um, in China, PPB um, has been an important innovation in terms of developing new technological innovations and um, they've also this market innovation in relation um, alongside PPB has enabled them to make the transition to traditional organic farming and they have a direct link to um, organic restaurants so they have um, a higher income for their produce. Okay, I'm going to finish there, but th these are just sort of uh, estimates of the innovations because some of them are categories of innovation, so we have to look further to get the actual numbers of innovation, but I just wanted to put them there because I think it's quite impressive considering there's just a few villages really involved in this study, how many innovations we found. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the last part of the program is uh, supposed to be a, a discussion around three questions that we develop ourselves. And uh, I frankly don't know how to do that. Christina, I don't know what we thought about that, but our three questions, what do you think? Um, One is, I don't know, if, if somebody wants to take the map, it's a sort of a wrap around. Yeah, I mean, I just thought there'd be a, a guide to the discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, people could, they're, they're all on the printed sheets. Right. So if you have a look at the questions, you know, if you're, um, if you can help us answer them, that would be great. Yeah, the, one of the questions is, what are the roles of genetic diversity and traditional knowledge in adaptation and restoration in different contexts? Uh, the second is, how can native plant diversity be effectively, sustainably, and equitably restored in agricultural and forest landscapes? And the third one, how can knowledge sharing and mutually beneficial partnerships between communities and scientists be promoted for adaptation? Because we have seen already good examples, but now the question is about promotion. So those are the three questions, and so we welcome any ideas. Bueno, empezaré yo. Este, solo quiero añadir un pequeño comentario. Eh, los ejemplos que han eh, descrito los señores panelistas me han parecido muy interesantes y fantásticos. Lo que más me ha gustado es el comentario que se ha visto repetido en casi todas las presentaciones de alguna u otra manera, que hay que gastar más tiempo en relaciones comunitarias que en la parte técnica. Este, eso es tan crucial y tan importante, lo vemos también desde el INIA, tenemos muy buenas intenciones, muy buenos científicos y no siempre los proyectos tienen éxito y simple y llanamente porque el vínculo con las comunidades locales no es el adecuado. Este, quiero felicitarlos a todos por ese gran nivel de participación que tienen en sus proyectos. Esperemos que se replique más en el futuro. También desde el Estado tenemos mucho interés en apoyar el desarrollo de la agricultura. Eh, los recursos siempre son limitados. Por lo tanto, no se puede ayudar a uno o dos este, agricultores eh, aislados. Siempre buscamos que haya unión entre ellos, haya representantes con los cuales podamos conversar para poder dar un impacto general a nivel de valle o comunidad. Muchas gracias. Hi. Um, it strikes me we're just entering a very interesting period of history, human history. Is it too long? Can you hear? Um, because um, with the potatoes going up another 200 meters every 20 years, eventually the area is going to get smaller and smaller, and with the sea level rising and taking over a lot of the fertile land on the seaside, we're going to lose land that way. And the only thing that seems to be working against it is what you're doing which is working out new species and, and experimenting with, with, with the help of the people who've been growing so many species for a very long time. It's like a, a push-pull situation. On the one hand, we can retreat 
from all the climate changes, and on the other hand, we advance with trying to experiment with with crops that might be able to to go back into the areas which otherwise wouldn't be able to be sustain agriculture. Hi, um, I have. I have a question for Cristina, and um, it's on intercultural dialogue. And intercultural, intercultural dialogue between, say, the West and indigenous peoples is key to a fair management of territory or landscape, including uh, cultural freedom and recognition of rights. Do you think the systems of ABS access benefit sharing of genetic recourse, uh, resources or um, traditional knowledge help to generate dialogue that is critical in this, in this way to the point that they dialogue about how to dialogue or how to, uh, how to uh, make decisions? And second, what risks could uh, some ABS systems take, uh, have? And how could the results of a good ABS system have an impact on other processes of policy making, such as processes for uh, granting rights to exploit uh, natural resources. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think um, the way ABS is um, currently conceived is um, kind of r rather a top-down framework where um, resources or you know, genetic resources are taken from communities, used, added value to, and then communities may get something uh, but often get nothing. Um, but I think this, this model with a SIP agreement of a two-way exchange of genetic resources does provide uh, an opening for intercultural dialogue. But I think that the sort of more common approach of resources just flowing one way and communities maybe one day getting benefits but no real co you know, collaboration in research happening doesn't really provide a very good framework for intercultural dialogue. Um, but I think if you, if you do have um, the two-way exchange, the reciprocal exchange and the collaborative research that goes along with it, I think that that kind of model can provide not just a framework for intercultural exchange and co-creation of knowledge between different knowledge systems, so sort of understanding and respect of different cultures between them, but also advance indigenous people's rights to land and other resources in the process, as Alejandro highlighted in this concrete example. Did you want to add anything? Okay. There was a question. Si. En primer lugar, les doy un saludo muy afectuoso, muy amoroso, muy cariñoso en nombre mío y de mis comunidades del Parque de la Papa. No casca semana, tampoco dicho, sino a su ambas hojas en Cancunasman y Eche, Cocta Casa, Neopartata, agradece su chis, a Nanchan, a Linta, a David Day, presentación manta, Cajli, compañerista con Ata, a Cristina, a Ever, a Alejandro, a Lino Mamán, a la moderadora Marlene Paita, ¿no? Bueno, eh. Antes que nada, eh, yo creo que hay que felicitar a la intervención de todos los panelistas cuyos nombres los ha señalado. Bueno, no hay ni ni un pacto jóctarik. Piconachos, hay un proyecto con achos hangonas y ancaranquitis comunidad con alguien ganamba, alguien casa. Bueno, lo que quiero decirles, donde ustedes han decidido oh, eh, ejecutar, efectuar, diseñar proyectos, en esas comunidades ahora eso está caminando bien. Eso es lo que puedo observar. Hoxta kashan kankonas tenikitis, kankonas académico hina, 
profesional hina estudió ciencia científica en Niaupaj Matancaitis a más años que fue más Matancaitis. Bueno y otra cosa eh, sería bueno que ustedes eh, los científicos, los que manejan el conocimiento científico académico, empujen todos los procesos, todos los sistemas de conocimiento. No los, haga, no los pongan abajo, sino que haya un diálogo más o menos horizontal entre todos los sistemas de conocimiento. Tukupuray, profesores. No canches, campesino, runa, cancunazo, científico, kunawan, cuscamanta, tías, pelean cananches. Allí en mi casa, guayacanches, kunaj, rimas canco, che, moderador, kunaj, rimas canco. Pero cuando se mandan ya chay taruana, chay tanik, no caigo que ya que ya chay coy chinespa, chiray con cangonas tanikitis, alguien de llanca naspa, ni aupa con purinapa. Añan chay que chisme, moderado alguna. Bien, eh, yo quiero finalmente terminar para decirles, eh, tenemos que sentarnos en una mesa y poner en debate nuestros sistemas de conocimiento. O sea, se habla de que hay un conocimiento tradicional, o sea, se reconoce, pero en la práctica eso no pasa. Entonces lo que queremos es que ustedes los científicos y nosotros los campesinos, los indígenas con nuestros conocimientos científicos podemos seguir adelante. Y felicito a todos ustedes por vuestras intervenciones porque han dado en el bull. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thanks very much and unfortunately on that note we'll have to stop because we are expected at another session the knowledge sharing speaking of knowledge on the third floor and uh, but you now you know all the speakers and you can talk to them in the rest of the evening or tomorrow thanks very much and thanks very much for your very good participation also i have lots of questions here